Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mike Sapp, and I am a Senior Vice President of Merchandising for PetSmart. Uh, that frankly wasn't for me, that was for PetSmart. Um, but uh, I'm representing about uh, 50 or so associates who are here today uh, and had made the uh, harrowing two-hour drive from Phoenix down here to get here uh, so that we could enjoy the better weather than we have up in Phoenix right now. Uh, I'm, almost, I'm also a wildcat, uh, and so uh, bear down uh, and uh, have the honor of serving on the advisory board for the Lundgren Center. So um, I, last year when uh, Scott shared with me what the theme for this year was going to be. Uh, it was around what is retailing going to look like in 10 years? And I kind of chuckled because I thought, you know, most retailers are trying to figure out what it looks like in the next 10 months. So going 10 years out might be a bit far. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought that if anybody can tell us what's coming at us years down the road, it's probably Tom Schwartztrauber. Tom is a, uh, he's a finance guy. He started his career uh, in healthcare, working with workers' comp, uh, has worked with GMAC on auto financing, and now leads the category management uh, process and strategic planning group at Nestle Purina. Uh, so he's a numbers guy. And he is probably the best person I know at taking numbers and forming a story from them and helping me and other retailers understand what's coming at us, uh, what we can do about it, uh, and, and kind of helping with the conversation so that executive committees at different companies uh, in the pet world and not in the pet world, frankly, uh, can understand what are our options and what can we do um, for the future. Um, not surprisingly, being with Nestle Purina, he's also a pet parent. So if we are fortunate, um, he will be able to somehow weave uh, Gladys, uh, who is his uh, schnauzer, into one of the stories that he tells today. So uh, since I am the only person standing between you and the person standing between you and a cocktail, uh, please join me in welcoming Tom Schwartztrauber. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Let me put down the precious, Lord of the Rings, precious. Um, so when Mike did ask me if I would talk about the future of retail, I said, sure, because last year, I think I did 81 presentations on this subject. Um, it's pretty fast moving. And when you think about it, right, when you look at what's happening, it feels pretty uncomfortable. I haven't heard retail apocalypse today, but I did last night. And Lord knows, in all the research that I do, and at Nestle, we do a lot of shopper-focused research. That is the number one place to look because that's who's in charge, and that's what's making this incredibly uncomfortable. Technology is empowering them, and they are in charge, and they know it. And when I say they, that's kind of a misnomer. It's really we. If we get out of this room and stop acting as executives or college students, right? So with regard to Gladys, I'll weave this in since Mike made me. Um, my dad and my stepmom live about eight blocks from me. And when I travel, and I travel a lot, I will dump Gladys on them, which is terrific. But then when I come back, they'll always say, hey, how did it go? Or, you know, how's it going right now? And as you watch what's happening, this isn't really a retail apocalypse. It is an entire reset of our consumer economy. I heard an industrial revolution statement earlier. It is gonna be very similar. And the researcher in me, when my dad or my stepmom asked me this, I say it's thrilling, right? It is really fascinating to study and be a part of, and we're all part of, this reset. Now the executive in me that's in this industry, to be honest, feels like I'm going through a car wash with no car. You're almost afraid to turn on Bloomberg on what you're gonna hear. And the presentation, when I had worked with Kim, she said basically, get it, get it to me anytime between February and March, and I got it pretty early. And that's before Claire's, that's before Nine West, that's before Bonton, Right? And so you have to look at all this and really get down to what is going on with root cause. Because at the end of the day, it's very easy to climb the ladder of inference and blame Amazon for everything. Amazon is a part of what's happening. Amazon is not everything that's happening. There are a whirlwind of factors that are occurring that are coming together to drive where we're at today and where we're at in this reset 
is retail is at a crossroads. So when I work with executives, right, and I do it globally, I had a bunch of New Zealanders I was working with three weeks ago. I start right out of the gate by asking them these two fundamental questions. Because what's going on with Amazon is fascinating. They're not a retailer, they're not. They're a data company. Now they happen to sell things, which is, it's a, it's a powerful thing, right? But most of their volume comes from AWS, Amazon Web Services. That's what powers everything from NASA to Netflix, okay? And if that's the case, and we, you know, I heard a couple people talk about ecosystem. Amazon's ecosystem is incredibly seductive. While we were all having dinner last night, out popped the news that Jeff Bezos admitted he has 100 million people on Prime, and one out of four Prime members said at this stage, right, at this stage in their journey, they would abandon Prime if, we ev if they ever lost the media. Now, I will testify to that, Vosh. I binge watched that on the flight out here. That was phenomenal, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what brings you into that Amazon ecosystem. It is extraordinarily sticky. You find all kinds of value, and in the 21st century, most retail sector an analysts are naming this the Amazon era. And that means every retailer in every category has got to answer me, or the, the private equity executives, has got to answer me as a shopper, why would I shop you? Give me a reason I would shop you, right? Make me feel a connection to you. Why you? And that, that word feel and connection, that is really important right now. Because if I don't feel anything from you, at best, you are nothing to me but a price point on my phone. That's not loyalty, right? We're gonna talk about some of that some more in a bit. And this is causing issue number two, right? Converts. We are at a place in time where we can keep tracking all the measures we're used to hearing, whether from what's coming off of Bloomberg or what's coming off of Motley Fool or what's coming out of boardrooms, sales per square foot, traffic, trips, penetration rates, all of that. But today and going forward, that's important but you had better be tracking your converts, those disciples, those people that are dedicated to you, the ones that you have tripped into wanting to stick with you thick and thin and talk to their friends, their family, their coworkers on why you. And it's normally about this point in the discussion, I will have one or more executives who really questions that shoppers are in charge. So this will be beneficial for my college friends back here. I'm gonna give you a really quick history lesson. So at the end of World War II, right, you have three entities that are playing a dance. Retailers, manufacturers, and shoppers. End of World War II, soldiers are coming back from Europe and Asia. God, that was awful. We just want stuff, right? And if you were on the home front, you're rationing, you're scraping, you're saving, it's tough. The war is over, you know what, you want stuff. And Truman agreed, give the people stuff, because there were moments that everybody was gonna strike, and he's like, oh no. So if you look at this dance that played between the three groups, manufacturers went right to the top of the heap, they're in charge. Because at this point, they have to just churn products out. People need stuff, people want stuff. And in economics, you know what happens from that? Scale, efficiency, and really good profit. Retailers are number two in this mix, right? They just have to take whatever the manufacturers are making. But the shoppers are dead last, right? They just, they're stuck with whatever's made. And they're geographically trapped. Retailers have a contained market right after World War II. There's a set geography. So retailers are making great money too. But if you dial the clock forward to the mid-70s, now there's actually quite a bit of data that's flying around. And you know who's capturing it? Retailers. So if you look at this dance, it's really kind of funny to me because retailers suddenly know more about the people that are buying these brands than the manufacturers that are making the brands, right? Retailers slide to the top, they're in charge. 
Manufacturers drop to number two, and the poor shopper's just dead last taking whatever's made, right? And it's during this time when retailers are in charge, you start seeing things show up like store clustering, localization, zone pricing. It's not really impacting how manufacturers are producing. They're still producing with scale. So in the P&Ls and in the money game, everybody's still winning. Now, the shopper may or not be happy with what they're getting, but at least everybody else is happy. Now move the clock forward one more time to the interwebs era. It shows up. Don't go too early, right? When it first shows up, it's kind of freakish. It's a dark, mysterious place. Those of you that are older, you know what I'm talking about. It's all filled with chat rooms, shadowy people talking about who's cooler, Captain Kirk or Captain Picard. We all know the answer to that. That's why it was a silly argument. You need to move it a little further forward to when iPhones show up and e-commerce is now in full swing. Who's in charge now? Shoppers. Shoppers are in charge. Why? What happened? Because the interwebs freed them from this constrained and contained environment. The things that you want are quite different from the things that he wants, which are different from the things that I want, which are different from the things that she wants. And at the end of the day, I don't have to just buy from the retailer within my eight mile radius. I can buy from anyone on the globe whenever I want, however I want. And instantly, retail falls to the bottom. Because these shoppers, they don't really care who they get these products from, the brands. So the manufacturers are still in the middle. Now they're stymied because scale is flying out the window, right? This shattering of desires. But now you all are scraping, fighting one another. Oh my god, what just happened? Loyalty went to an, it really is sitting on a knife edge. And every retailer is experiencing a pass or fail grade depending on that next engagement with you. And once you acknowledge shoppers are in charge and they have all this technology that make them know just as much as we do, then understanding this gets pretty darn easy. What an uncomfortable place we're all in. So the next conversation I have with most executives is, just make sure you understand goods are commoditized, and they will be for quite some time. This is not gonna change. How we address it, and I've heard a lot of good commentary on how we address it, that will change. But all I have to type is price deflation in Google, and I can look at six pages of news, and you can see the race to the bottom playing out. Shoppers are playing us, right? So once you understand that truth, one of the first things I'll do in strategic planning with an executive committee is I'll say, what would you do if everything in your store that you sold today was free? How would you make money? Of course, normally what happens is the CFO gets furious. This is ridiculous. What are we doing? And strangely, the HR guy does too, and why he has an affinity for the p and I don't know. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they start recognizing price matching algorithms have already taken us there. And shoppers are playing us. So we have to rethink the model, and that's exactly what's gonna happen. And the next piece that we have to, it's a brutal fact that we have to understand, is shoppers don't have to come to us for products anymore. They choose, right? And based on which category we're talking about, I saw the 10% of sales, that's at a total level. The whole e-commerce is 10% of sales. That number changes pretty seriously depending on which category you're looking at, right? And so a second label for the time frame that we're in is called the replenishment era. Because anything that's in center store, when you're in grocery, for my college friends, center store is anything that, just like it sounds, that's in the center of the store, not on the outer perimeter. That's fair game for every shopper to evaluate every time they're in there. Today, do I want to buy it online? Right? And once we acknowledge it's not our choice anymore on how a shopper will secure goods, it's up to them. We have to actually incent them which way do we want them to go and why do we want them to go there. And frankly, I think it was this week, I boosted an email I got from Amazon 
where it was a big service propaganda email because they understand one of the other things that retail will be looking at next is how do I start incorporate services into my store? Well, they're gonna bring the services to you if you're a shopper. So as we think about the experiential and replenishment economy, we are moving to a place where it isn't up to us anymore. We have to figure out how they come to us. So when we talk about change, I always like to talk about make sure we understand why this feels so uncomfortable and that there's points, if we're listening to the news about retail, you wonder, am I gonna need a Tylenol Excel, you know, the extra strength one and a Pepsid AC by the end of this report? Because change happens on two fronts. Pace of change, right, how frequent is this happening? And depth of change, is it titanic or is it trivial? And what's making things really awkward is over the last three to five years in particular, the rate of change has been astounding. It has been rapid, it is unprecedented. We are seeing multiple black swan events. For those of you that are not familiar, a black swan event is when two or more unrelated things, that they just come together and suddenly we have a quantum shift and, and, and a new normal. And as these rapid changes are happening, these are not trivial changes, some of them are titanic where now you thought you were playing a game of Stratego and whoopsie, we're playing Battleship. And this is happening in three different spheres. The landscape itself, how shoppers are behaving, and technology. I would say two and a half to three years ago, the researchers I, that I worked with, we were stunned by what was happening in how shoppers were conducting, navigating, acting, procuring, buying, I would say today tech can just, that blows that away. So when I work on content, including this deck, in my home office, I generally have three laptops running at the same time. It looks like I could land a small space shuttle. There is the deck that I am building, right? Then there's the laptop with all the research and it's all split screened. I'm moving it around, not like Minority Report, although that would be cool if I could take a glove and move it in space. It's normally dragging things with a mouse. The third is the stream, the feed, right? The feed that's coming from the retail sector analysts or the Wall Street announcements on who's announcing earnings. And may I say, anytime I actually turn my head and listen to the feed, I always hear Wall Street people talking about sales per square foot, right? You know how this goes. These are the measures we've measured in retail for years. Do you know where these measures came from? They came from before the US Civil War and do you know who invented these measures? What became Macy's? And this is normally right before there is an industry specialist that comes on and then announces, I love this part, we are at an inflection point in the retail industry. We need, we need to be agile. There is a lot of change happening. And we are gonna have to do things, we are gonna have to double down on doing things differently. My, my favorite is when I hear someone say, we need to triple down. Because what it does is it lets all of us know that those of us that doubled down, we just didn't care enough. Um, but at the end of the day, you look at this and now translate this into what you're seeing in retail itself. My first college professor, he was a genius, Dr. Butler, and he told my whole class one day, whatever career you choose, just remember you are what you measure. What are we measuring? At a time when we're talking about it is change, it's unprecedented, we need to be agile, we're at an inflection point, the whole consumer economy is basically going through a reset, and we're measuring everything from before the blue met the gray. What do you think's gonna happen? You end up surrounding yourself in a sea of sameness, and in Excel, we would call this a circular reference, and in Psych 101, they call this a death spiral. And this is why we're seeing some of these reports that we see in retail upheaval. Shopper behavior, my God, this has evolved. And so a lot of times when I'm working with executives, I try and make it real for them because they just don't understand that Amazon in particular, that it's called informing behaviors. Amazon has changed how we are evaluating every retailer, both physical and online, forever. So picture it. I sound like I'm on Golden Girls, right? Picture it. Um, 
But picture it, in, in St. Louis, I own four homes. Um, strangely, they're all next, to, they're, they're next door to each other, don't ask. Um, I like fixing up homes. Um, my neighbors do think I'm trying to create one side of the Monopoly board, and I'm always like, go Baltic <laughs> Avenue, right? But at the end of the day, if I have time, and when I do, I'll start doing the fixer-upper routine, and just picture, Tom needs a Phillips screwdriver. Okay, now we're gonna understand what I'm talking about on shopping behavior. So Tom needs a Phillips screwdriver. The Home Depot, that is about, a, it, the closest one is 12 to 15 minutes away. It's in an area called Brentwood Square. That wraps around an area called Hanley Station. It has all the major retailers. You would recognize all of them, right? PetSmart, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, Walmart, yada, yada, yada. But I like to refer to that parking lot as Thunderdome. I have never seen a parking, like this, a parking lot like this in the nation. All the lanes are super, super skinny. You feel like as you make the left turn in there, somebody from Hunger Games should say, may the odds be forever in your favor that you do not end up sideswiped, lose both mirrors, have somebody hurling profanity at you like something from Hell's Kitchen simply because they wanted your parking spot. But we digress. Assume I find a parking spot. Now I'm walking into the entrance at Home Depot. Oh my God, this store is the size of two football fields. I need a Phillips screwdriver. I pass the returns counter, I'm making a sharp right, I am now going down the main drive aisle, and I don't know about you, but I end up with crazy talk going through my head as I'm trying to find something, right? Where you've got your head cocked, you're walking, you're walking, you're walking, going, I wonder if I should look at the signage. I wonder if I should look at the actual, what's on the, on the shelf. Would I see a screwdriver if I was looking at the shelf? Will they label it tools? Will they label it screwdriver? Wait a minute. There's an entire second aisle. There's another aisle that goes between there. This is two. Is the signage actually telling me what's in this section and there's different <laughs> signage back there? Was that furnace filters? I think I should get a furnace filter. Uh, I need to be focused, right? My God, I'm walking farther than the Von Trapp family singers walked to get out of Austria in World War II. What is this? Oh my God, there's tools. <laughs> now I'm walking down that aisle and I'm going hammer, 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 Phillips. Oh my God. But now do I want a long one, small one? I don't know. How much time am I burning? Now I'm walking all the way back. It's time to get the hell out of Dodge, right? I need to get back and work on my fixer upper. Oh, the checkout lanes are all the way down there. Oh, and there's 10 lanes, but only two of them have a cashier. I'm gonna to go to self-checkout because I can see there's two contractors there. I see lots of plywood, that's gonna take forever. I go through the self-checkout, yay, right? That was fast, and then I walk out, wah, wah, wah. I'm on the wrong end of the football field. My car is way down there. I've burnt, and now I finally find my car. I get out of Thunderdome. I'm back to my house. We're an hour and 10 minutes into this journey. Compare and contrast to I go down to my computer, Type www.amazon.com, Phillips screwdriver, three rows down, buy it now. So what's important to shoppers now, because I'm not picking on Home Depot, I'm picking on all of us. This is how we're being evaluated with every purchase. Every purchase. So when we talk about what's important and we talk about price deflation and the race to the bottom, do you think if Home Depot was 50 cents cheaper on that, on that Phillips screwdriver, that was worth an hour and 20 minutes of my time in Thunderdome? What if Amazon was a dollar more? So convenience reigns supreme, and perceived value is number two. I do not have time to talk about all this technology stuff. I've spent a day and a half, I've done day and a half work sessions on what's happening with technology. I will say, voice is the one that should haunt you all. This thing is coming like a freight train. If you do not have a strategy on voice this year, I'd rethink that one. Let's break it down real quick. So I, I'd mentioned my dad and stepmom, they live eight blocks away from me. So I see all the Nestle people back there. I've told them about my dad and all of, he has a lot of chronic issues right now. And two in particular that are very prominent. One, he has a crippling addiction to Ancestry.com. There are terrible things that have come out of that. 
We can talk about that at either dinner or tomorrow. Um, but two, he has a raging obsession with his Echo Dot. <laughs> now he, this is a presentation I don't ever want to have to give again. I had to do one on social demographic splits and technology adoption. I think there were two people I just saw that got very excited, and the other 99.999% .999 of you had a thought bubble that said, I would rather be on fire. <laughs> but my dad, he would be classed as the silent generation. He was born between 1920 and the mid-40s, right? And when you do the, the splits, this is the generation that currently is over-indexing with voice technology adoption. And it totally makes sense. Back in the day, pre-voice, this is the generation that would have turned on the Weather Channel 24 hours a day, right? So when you stop by and you say, hey, how's it going? And they come to you and go, my god, there was a thunderstorm in Topeka. What do you think about that? And all that I'm thinking is, I don't care. It's a state away. What do I care? Well, what do you think's happening with this generation with voice? With Alexa, who is AI-infused and learning from him what he likes, what he doesn't like, how to talk to him. This isn't the Weather Channel talking at him. Alexa is his friend. I think my stepmother believes Alexa might be his soulmate. <laughs> but his generation under-indexes on commerce. Of course they would. They already have all the stuff. I mean, they've got a lot of stuff. They don't need stuff. But what happens with my generation and younger, especially all of you young people over there? I'm a Gen Xer. You know what's happened on the generational splits when we look at voice right now? We're over-indexing on commerce. We under-index on use, but we over-index on commerce. So is it a mystery to anyone in this room why Jeff Bezos in February at the, earnings in, at the earnings report out said, oh, we were so pleasantly surprised by voice, and we will be doubling down on that in 2018. It's not an enigma. That man, he is a genius, right? Because what he's doing is he understands that there's two facets to shopping. There's all the things that everyone in this room, including me, finds exciting, right? The inspiration, the aspiration, the creativity, the social aspects, whether it's with your family, your friends, or with the actual people that work there. That's the fun stuff. They understand there's a whole lot of friction, pain points, chore aspects, nightmare aspects, and they're going to make that go away to the point you don't even sense your shopping. OK? And the only analogy I can give you is when I came up on the stage, I do not remember anybody asking, do we have enough electricity when Tom gets on the stage? Have we ordered some? I know we refilled water pitchers. Should we order electricity? What do you think is going to happen with replenishment categories? Because as all this technology comes together, it will predict when you need more and go ahead and take care of it for you. Are we having fun? <laughs> so this is a beautiful slide said no one. And I constructed this in February. And we all know there's a lot of stuff that went down since then. In 2017, 9,000 stores closed. Cushman's has already predicted, along with Credit Suisse, that we'll have a minimum of 12,000 stores that go down this year. And Yahoo Finance, the week before last, and I boosted this to a number of executives that I work with, has said within the next five to seven years, 80,000 stores will be shuttered. And this is what's fueling Wall Street, sector analysts, all of them. They are giddy with excitement on, we got a story here, right? Retail apocalypse, retail apocalypse. I heard retail Mageddon. Can I just say? Um, I really have a distaste for when people chuck out the first syllable of a word, add a, add a new word to try and make it creative, like, brand, what is it, Brangelina, that, that whole thing. I don't, that's not cool. Although I will say on Big Bang Theory, when Sheldon started dating Amy and they called him Shamey, that was funny. <laughs> but I will say this, when we look at stuff like this, it is not an apocalypse. That is a misstatement. 
do not misunderstand me. This is going to be painful. But when I hear things like physical retail is dead, oh, yeah, that's exactly why Amazon bought Whole Foods. There are a host of reasons physical retail is not dead. And there are a host of reasons stores are closing and bankruptcies this year will be very significant. And that includes a really intense mix of federal interest rate tax hikes, the debt that sits within this sector, changes in tax laws, which means the interest that we can write off is now a little more difficult to write off, way too much, phys way too much physical space for how shoppers are now conducting commerce, technological advances, I could go on, and at the end of the day, this is all coming together and it is creating a new normal for what physical will be. So for my college friends, I hope they taught you about the purchase funnel because all I can tell you is you can let that go now. The internet blew it up. So the purchase funnel, historically, right, a manufacturer would make people aware of products through media. So let's just pretend we're on HGTV, Fixer Upper is running, here come the ads, yay! And the shopper goes through very different phases of, well, do I want it, do I want it, do I want it, do I want it? And then bim, bam, boom, in the historical purchase funnel, at the bottom sits our retailer, and the only role of the retailer during that framework, you'd better have a cashier at the checkout lane and make sure you've packed out enough products so that they know it's, it's here, you can buy it here. You dial this clock forward to when the interwebs is raging and all the media now, whether we're talking Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, the lot of it, you're not just being made, made aware of it, you could actually just buy it from there. So now if I can buy at any point along the purchase funnel, what on earth is the role of the store? It's not to say that sales won't happen there. Of course they're gonna happen there but they don't have to happen there unless the shopper wants to have it there. That means the physical store's role will change. I believe somebody from Williams Sonoma was here. Are they here or coming? You are a mentor retailer to everybody in this room. It is amazing the things that you are doing. And when I am asked point blank, dude, what should we be doing with the experiences in our store? Please just tell me what to do. I can't tell you what to do. You are the owner of your equity. You determine literally what is in scope and out of scope based on the richness of the territory that your equity allows. But I can give you a framework that as you look through it, can you say this is hitting on all five of these measures? and this feels appropriate, right? Does it fit? My advice to everyone in this room, get tough skin. You're gonna need it because Wall Street and the sector analysts from the moment Toys R Us announced liquidation, they're getting hardcore. And the comments that they're making are really barbed. And the fact that Bonton went to liquidation is only gonna sharpen their claws. And I've got nothing, nothing I can do to console you on this other than to say they still haven't wrapped their heads around, truly, this is a reset of the economy. They still keep climbing the ladder to this is Amazon, it's Amazon, and it's Amazon, which means they have a dual focus on retail and on Google, right? Because Google has become search of last resort. Most shoppers, they start their search now on Amazon with Prime clicked. And if they can't find what they're looking for, they unclick Prime. Oh, it's still got to be on the, it's got to be on Amazon. And if they still can't find it, only then do they go to Google. And what is Google's MO? They're a search engine. This feels awkward, right? So real quick, I'm going to go through, as you look at the future of retail, here are some things I would be looking to do or implement in your strategies right now. Number one, it really isn't about what you want to sell anymore. There's nothing I can do if you come to me and say, I've chosen my assortment and it's based on the margin that I make on X. Really? Is that what a shopper wants? Because it's not about you, it's about them.
So Mike had mentioned before I came to Nestle, I worked for GMAC, that was the financial lending arm of General Motors. I managed two billion in assets. I managed all car dealerships in Arkansas and Mississippi, and the first lesson they told us as we went into business, don't be this guy, that's Henry Ford, right? And the reason they said that, so back in the 20s, going into the 1920s, he had a 70 market share, could you imagine? And General Motors showed up on the scene, and its claim to fame and its innovation was, you could have colored cars. And when his executive committee said, uh, I think we need to have colored cars, you know what he said? This will sound familiar to today. Uh, no, that's margin dilutive. No, that's not how we make money. I'm not adding complexity, right? He found all the reasons for my model, my financial model, it's working for me, and change is hard. And he literally had the audacity to make that statement. My shopper can have any color car they want as long as it's black. Do you know what happened to his market share in a four and a half, a four and a half year window? It went from a 70 to the teens. So don't be that guy. Somebody had mentioned the beauty industry. That is one to track. The beauty industry, Alta and Sephora in particular, amazing things that they're doing. But to build on that, since that's been mentioned, I will use restoration hardware as my example on building stories. Gary, when he left Pottery Barn and became CEO of Restoration Hardware, if you remember, any of you, Restoration Hardware was going bankrupt. It was a crazy store. It was like an Ace Hardware that was filled with all this 1940s vintage stuff from that Christmas story movie that runs 24 hours a day on Christmas Day, right? All this stuff, it's overpriced, it's piled everywhere. Why would you buy it, right? What happens when you just fill a store with unproductive inventory that no one wants? On paper, it looks like you should be making just a ton of money, right? The margin on this is awesome. But what actually happens? Your cash flow is just stymied and things are sinking like a bomb over Dresden in World War II. And Gary came in and said, nope, this is not about packing out product and having just more stuff on a shelf. He blew that thing up and he created one hell of a story and it went to a store that was more of a design gallery and its story was mood, inspiration, aspiration, and my favorite, attainable elegance. You walked into each of those parts of Restoration Hardware and you felt something. And he was one of the first people that actually said, good God, if you want the paint on the wall, I'll sell that too, if you want to create the whole mood in your house. That is why when his earnings were announced, I believe three months ago, he blew the doors off. Has Angela presented at this conference before? I think she has, hasn't she? We need to print this and send it to her and just ask her to autograph it, right? And she can send it all back to all of us and we can use it as an inspiration. Stay classy, Ange, right? Because what she's talking about here with Apple Town Squares, it's third place. First place is home. It's where you spend the most amount of your time, in theory, you're with your family, right? Second place is work. What is third place for most US citizens? It is Starbucks. And you know why that model works? They don't care what you want to do when you're in the store. In fact, Angela doesn't care what you want to do when you come to the town square. You know what the unifying tie is that binds at Starbucks? We've all come in from all walks of life. Some are just coming in and coming out because you just have to get that espresso fix. That would be me. Some are college kids with noise-canceling headphones just working on papers. Some are little kids that are getting sugar highs, drinking frappuccinos in colors God didn't intend. It doesn't matter why you're there and you can stay however long you want to stay, just hang and be part of the Starbucks family. And that's exactly what she's creating with Apple Town Squares. Personalization's been mentioned. Be very careful here. It's a double-edged sword. We call it peanut butter spreading. You can't just send out mass emails where all of a sudden I pop that thing open and I go, oh my God, why did they send this to me? Guinea pig bogos? You don't even know me. You go to my spam folder, right? On the flip, 
Two weeks ago, in came all the research on retailer efforts around personalization, and what did 75% of all Americans say? Retailers' current efforts around personalization are, and this is their word, creepy. Hmm. The second word that they had for it was stalkerish, which means the tech that's coming into play can't seem to stop from making people feel extraordinarily uncomfortable. Words are important. Word choices are very important. You have to make me feel like you know me, but don't make me feel like I'm going to open a closet and scream. <laughs> if anyone's been to the Nike Soho store, good job by you. If you haven't, I'd get there. This store, they don't measure sales at all. They don't. Really, when you go to this store, what they're measuring, it's almost like when you work with a media or an ad agency or a media group. It's like a Millard Brown report. Perceptions, impressions, right? You have quantitative research and qualitative research. Quant is exactly what it sounds like. It's giving me dollars, it's giving me numbers. I got the real meat of the matter. Qual is the soft stuff. How did people feel, right? What were your perceptions? Did I make an impression on you? Guess what kind of KPIs are sitting with Nike? This store, its only role is to amplify the Nike brand in all of our minds. You should find mentors and you should track them. And I don't mean track them like, what did they say about earnings per share? Did they beat it by two cents? That's fine, but no, that's not what I'm talking about. You need to track how they're doing what they're doing. How are they talking to, wait for it, the group that's in charge, shoppers? What are the words that they're saying? What's the imagery they're using? How are they connecting with people? When you go into their stores, what does navigation feel like? Is it a Where's Waldo moment where you feel like you're in London in the Kew Garden in the Boxwood Garden where you need to shoot off a flare because nobody's going to find you? What are your sight lines like? So when people ask me what the actual future future, the, that was kind of the now stuff you have to do. This is the stuff that's coming. I will not make any statement or guarantee on how fast this is hitting, but it is hitting. Omnichannel's dead. It's going to be dead. And as you go into planning, you won't plan, here's my physical strategy and here's my online strategy because I'm an omnichannel retailer. Good job by us. Somebody had mentioned connecting with consumers. And it's pretty damn hard now. It has never been, e it has never been easier to communicate at a consumer. It's never been harder to connect with them. So there is an analytics group called Fortune Lords. All they do is slice and dice YouTube. That's fun. You can get all kinds of wild stuff, wild statistics for Trivia Night. Things like they have 5 billion views on YouTube per day. I hope that's not just two people. But at the end of the day, what do we do when we go on YouTube? I'm assuming we all go on YouTube. Up comes the ad. Is there anyone in here that as the ad comes up, you're just like, sorry, I got to watch this? No, we do the apple dropping in Times Square moment, right? You go down to the lower right, four, three, two, one, yay, the skip ad box. I don't even know what the hell they were saying, right? I was just so focused on the box is coming. Oh my God, here comes the box. And so as you build your plan, you're not going to build a plan around physical, and you're not going to build a plan around the interwebs. You're going to build a plan around moments. Moments that you have as a retailer to actually have a shopper's attention and the ability to connect with them. I mentioned Amazon's really been focusing on getting the pain and friction out. But this one's coming fast. There are new VR goggles that are being introduced as of this week, I believe. At least the news stated that this was just launching. Um, when you look at a website today, whether it's Walmart, Amazon, Macy's, for those of us that are old enough, it feels like a 1975 Sears catalog. It's just you're online staring at it on your screen. It's like all these things are just laid out. And instead of flipping pages, you're just scrolling down. 
what's happening out there with those Samsung events, that's gonna be happening in our homes. The, the pain points in VR goggles right now, cost, weight, you really don't wanna, <laughs> it's kinda sad when you go to Samsung 80, 837 and you see somebody put on the goggles and they're so light, right? They just, also you see them just start falling because they're just, oh my God, these things are so heavy. They're very light now. There aren't a lot of wires. It's gonna get very, very mainstream as we move forward. And so as we talk about building experiences in the physical store, be prepared. You're gonna build them now and you're gonna reinvent them soon. Because when we enter a virtual world, when all we're doing is sitting on the living room couch, Game of Thrones is on, Daenerys shows up, you're like, oh my God, that woman just babbles. Unless she's on a dragon, I'm not watching this. And you put on your VR goggles and off you go. And haptic gloves make the experience that much more real. So now you're not just seeing, you're touching too. This will transform retail. I mentioned those awful things happening with my dad and, and, and Alexa. And for me, personally, I think it will get worse. And 2018 is the year it's gonna get worse. Not, not with me and my dad, but watching what my dad does with Alexa, because she's untethered. In every Ford, Toyota, BMW, my new Mini Cooper, there sits Alexa, right? Tethered means she's stuck in the little black cylinder on my dad's kitchen. Untethered, she's floating free, right? She's in cars, she's in Whirlpool appliances. For crying out loud, she's in Fitbit. When I'm working out, I am not having her talk to me. And yet there she is, and she's all pervasive. No matter where you go as you look at the future, voice is a big thing. It is going to be more transformative than phones because why? You can now do computing while you're doing other things. I can drive and instead of having to, please don't text and drive, I'll just talk to Alexa and I'll tell her, hey, order me some dog food. Mmm. This is a big change state. And I would say, I'm not gonna mention the retailers' names, what's happening in technology already is startling. I'll give you an example of what's truly unfolding before us right now. In one retailer, the moment I walk in the door, they have facial recognition technology cameras in the ceiling and they pull up two years of transaction history on me instantly and they identify how often have I been in that store in the last two months. And the moment they dissect my frequency for being in there, they have classified me. I hope the names aren't rude, right? Like easy target or he's really ignorant. He doesn't know where he's going. You know, I, I just, I don't know what I'm labeled, but I do know that they label us. Because I have the app, they are now GPS tracking me throughout the store. They are watching my every move and they're pulling up navigation patterns for, is everybody walking in that direction? What's the type of merchandise we should put over there? Everybody seems to swing left. They're tracking everything I'm pulling down, downloading in the store. Is he checking prices while he's in here? Is he showrooming us? Oh my God, is he playing Chihuahua or Muffin again? Do you know what I'm talking about? It is so bizarre, and you can pull it up on your phones while I talk, I'm almost done here. It's kind of funny, too. Chihuahua or Muffin is a humongous grid, and it is nothing but Chihuahua faces and blueberry muffin tops, and you have to figure out which is which. <laughs> they don't care what you're doing in the store, but they're tracking what you're doing in the store, right? And this is what's happening now. And then these retailers also have cameras sitting on the shelves in the very aisles that you're walking in. And it's not because of shrinkage, right? Is he stealing? It's because they're trying to look at how am I emoting? Is he confused? Does he look perplexed? Is he smiling? Is he investigating? And what do you think it's doing to the KPIs for these retailers? And this is who you're competing with. So when we talk about personalization, how much do you think they know about all of us? When we talk about data, just so that we're clear, because stuff like this, sometimes you go, God, that sounds so Star Trek. Let me make it clear. At the end of 2015, IBM announced that on a daily basis, we were creating 2.5 quintillion pieces of data. 
Do you know how much a quintillion is? It's a billion billions. It's a number one with 16 zeros behind it times two and a half, and that was at the end of 2015, which means we're over three now. Let that register, because IBM then followed up that story with a doozy that all the data that we have in the world on everything, absolutely everything, right? 91% of it was created in the last 18 to 24 months. Feel like it's moving fast now. So just a couple things to consider and I'm, I'm done. So I am often hit with about this time in a presentation, Tom, you just don't get it. <laughs> Amazon is destroying my category. I hear you, right? They're not the nemesis, but we should just throw in the towel. I don't get it. I hear you. It's a crazy time to be alive, right? Because we're in the trees and we can't really see the forest. And when you look at how nasty Wall Street is getting in their analysis of this sector, they have retailers on death watch and there's two. And intuitively, when you think about nutritional supplements and vitamins, yeah, I could climb the ladder and go, I guess those would just move online. Hmm, who knew? But that's not a true statement. Next to it, you have Supplement Superstore. Anybody buy from them? This retailer's double digit gains year after year. They have a 600,000 follower scene playing out on Instagram, a podcast with, I believe, 1.1 million followers. And it's so big, he now just does entrepreneurial podcasts, right? But I, wanna I want you to listen to the two statements on these retailers. On the left, Andy, who if you do listen to the podcast, this guy's, he's pretty rough. He is not polished. I mean, there's gonna be a couple points you feel like you're listening to somebody that worked on the docks for a while. You're like, wow, that just happened, right? But you know what else he's bringing when he talks like that? Not the vulgarity, but just the directness of it all. It's authentic. And what he says is, I really don't care what your health and wellness objectives are. I don't care if you wanna lose weight. I don't care if you're just trying to keep your ticker ticking. I don't care if you're doing a marathon. I don't care if you're one of those obsessed CrossFit people. I am here for you. And my only goal is to get you to your goals. Contrast that with GNC, we sell stuff. Who's connecting to whom? Mm -hmm. I mentioned have tough skin. Think about Jiffy Lube and your experience there, right? When you go to a Jiffy Lube, you pull up, a man in a blue jumpsuit opens a garage door, ushers you across a tile floor to some strange lobby that has really, really uncomfortable plastic chairs, there's a television in a corner blaring some old episode of Ellen. You're like, God, how long is this gonna take? Next thing you know, the jumpsuit man is dragging you into the garage, he's got the hood open, and he's talking to you like you're an expert in combustion engines too, right? He's talking about all this stuff, and you're nodding, like you, you get it, right? Where your mental bubble's going, I didn't know there was a filter on that, that's interesting. But you're just, oh yeah, yeah, replace that, man. Why do you think Jiffy Lube has a 14-point checklist? because those just happen to be the 14 point things that might make your car stop working. And what do you think Wall Street's doing? Coming up with a checklist for which retailers will be casualties in what's happening in retail today. And what I would tell you is, this is the stuff, unlike Jiffy Lube, that won't keep you on the road, this is the stuff that could take your vehicle off. And so I leave you with just two thoughts, a red pill and a blue pill like the matrix. <laughs> so after a presentation like that, you can take a blue pill and you can believe whatever you wanna believe about what's happening in our sector, right? And at the end of the day, I will know you are just a battery for robots. Or you can take the red pill and if you remember what he promised, was it Neo? What he promised Neo was, I can't guarantee you anything, but I can show you what's happening and you can find your path. I hope this was helpful. Um, that's all I got. <laughs>